Hello all, Mariah here from Pain-Free Fitness, and as you can tell probably by the title of this video, this is all about boobies and breast augmentation. I know the lighting and the angle is probably not the most flattering, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it right now because my breasts hurt. I'm about three days post-op and I will talk about my experience later. One of my goals with pain-free fitness as a brand is not only to give you those, uh, those quick and easy routines that you can do to help you live a more pain-free life, but also to educate people on how to do that themselves. And with how prevalent this particular operation is becoming, I just think it's really important to talk about it and also to dispel some of the weird myths and misconceptions about it as well. I am going to be writing a blog alongside this video, so if you prefer to read information rather than watch it and see it, then there will also be that available on my website, 10minutefit.com, uh, and I'll post the link down below. That being said, uh, just a quick disclaimer, I am not a medical, medical professional. I'm going to be giving you kind of some information that I learned from my research and also that I learned from my uh, plastic surgeon and all the surgeons that I talked to. But if you are considering doing the operation or if you really want some legitimate information, do your own research, talk to a board-certified plastic surgeon, make sure they are board-certified, um, and just make sure you really educate yourself thoroughly on that first. When it comes to breast augmentation, uh, you do not choose your cup size. So if you are attached to cup size, you're gonna have to let that go before you go in for your consultations. That's not how the implants are sized, nothing like that. Implants are sized based on cc's. So that is the volume of liquid that is inside the implant, I believe. The same amount of cc's will look very, very different on different body types. So I am five foot three on a good day and I am very petite. So 200 cc's on me would look very, very different than 200 cc's on someone that's five nine and maybe has a little bit of a, a wider build. So you have to keep all of that in mind. Also the difference in how your chest wall and kind of your rib cage is shaped and your shoulders and, and all that stuff. So you can't really get too attached to that either. Profile of the implant is going to be how wide the implant is and how far forward it projects. Uh, different volume implants will have different widths. Your doctor is going to take measurements of your breast width diameter based on kind of how your anatomy works. You can usually only fit a certain width of implant in your breast pocket. Let's say I really like the look of a 300cc implant, but a lower profile in that implant would be too wide. In that case, my doctor can choose 300ccs and just choose a higher profile implant, and the implant will be a little bit narrower, but just project out forward just a tiny bit more and that will allow them to fit the same amount of volume in the breast without uh, you know, having to choose a smaller implant to accommodate the width. I hope that makes sense. And by the way, we're talking like centimeters of difference. We're not talking about like an inch more of projection forward. Okay. So your surgeon is the best person to determine the profile and kind of the size that's appropriate for you, but that is what profile means. Those saline and silicone, those are kind of the, the main ones that are given to you as options. Uh, there's also something new called the ideal implant, and then there's something else that just kind of came out. I don't remember what it's called. But saline and silicone, we'll just talk about those. So saline implants are um, saltwater filled. They have been um, long regarded as sort of the safer option uh, because when they rupture, uh, saline is really, really easily reabsorbed by the body. Okay, um, the drawback to when they rupture is that you get kind of like a flat tire type of a thing going on. So the all of the liquid leaks out 
uh, it, generally speaking, and you get kind of like one flat boob, and then the other one is normal. <laughs> uh, so that that is how a saline implant works. They do still have a silicone shell, though. Uh, silicone implants back in the day got a very bad reputation um, because when silicone would rupture, it would kind of leak into the lymph nodes and the surrounding parts of the chest and into the underarm and things like that, which is obviously no good for a lot of reasons. Uh, you do still have to be 22 years old in, I think, most places to consent to get a, a silicone implant but they are made of more of a cohesive gel. So when they rupture, you can look at like videos of this online and it's difficult for an implant to rupture in the first place, but it does happen. When they do rupture, the gel still kind of stays cohesively attached to the gel around um, it. That's not to say that when silicone, when a silicone implant ruptures, it's not necessarily dangerous or something that you have to look out for but it is not anywhere near where it was back in the day. The recommendation that I got from my surgeon is that you get an MRI every like three to four years or so, a certain percentage each year that the uh, that the likelihood of rupture goes up. So that's something just to kind of pay attention to and MRIs are pretty darn expensive, but you know, I'll, I'll take that risk in order just to make sure that I don't have a silent rupture going on. Because a lot of the time now when a silicone implant ruptures, you don't really know until it reaches a point where you're starting to get like some irritation and kind of weird things happening there. So uh, silicone and saline, those are kind of the, the two uh, choices that you're going to be presented with. And Uh, another choice that you are going to be faced with is uh, textured or smooth implants, uh, and then you get round or anatomical as well. Textured, smooth, anatomical, and then you can choose kind of how cohesive they are, and usually they'll let you feel them and give them a little squeeze in the office, uh, which, is, which is pretty fun. The most common incisions that I am aware of are under the breast, so in the crease, uh, through the areola, through the armpit, and then I believe saline implants can be inserted like through the belly button too. I have no idea how that works, but those are those are the choices that you get. placement of the implant, uh, the two main options that you have, again, there are a lot of other kind of like sub options in there, but the two main options that are most well known are going to be under, so submuscular, uh, under the muscle, or you can go subglandular, which is over the muscle, but under the breast tissue. Um, and from what I understand, a lot of implants these days are placed submuscularly. Um, but if you have a lot of breast tissue to begin with, surgeons will opt to sometimes place the implant over the muscle because you have enough breast tissue to cover that implant. My friends that have had over the muscle implants, that's why they have enough to cover. And there are also, uh, you know, a couple of pros and cons as far as going over versus under the muscle for athletes and things like that. And you can talk about that with your surgeon once you get there. I had the option of going either under general anesthesia for my surgery or doing something called uh, conscious IV sedation, which is also known as twilight sleep. Um, IV sedation is generally a lot cheaper because you don't have to get the anesthesiologist there, so you don't have to pay for the anesthesiologist. Um, I think that this the fear factor for some people with that one is that uh, there's this misconception that you're like awake and like suffering this slow torture the entire surgery and it is nothing like that. You, like sometimes you'll wake up for very very brief periods of time but you are drugged off your ass. Like you can't, I can't, I couldn't feel anything. Uh, they have the nurse anesthetist there that monitors your the level of anesthetic in your system and when they 
um, when they sense that you are kind of coming out of it, they just give you just enough to kind of put you right back under. Uh, you also recover a lot quicker from it typically, so you don't get as sick afterwards. And you know, a lot of people have a really hard time coming out of general anesthesia as well. So uh, that is that. The number one thing that I was afraid of happening was something called capsular contracture. The capsule contracts, uh, capsular contracture, and the muscles kind of um, contract around it and you wind up with this really hardened kind of painful shell around the implant. Um, and there are different grades of it. So I think, a, you know, like a grade one capsular contracture, most people just kind of ignore. Like, even if you're diagnosed with it, it's fine. It's not really painful. You can't really see it or notice it too much. Um, and then it goes all the way up to grade four. And usually at like grade three or four, you're going to want to get it fixed. Um, capsular, con capsular contracture is one of the scarier complications because it can happen at any time when you have your breast implants. Uh, that is something that I really asked a lot of questions about and researched a lot. Um, there are, there are a lot of complications that can happen, a lot of which are really rare. You know, there are, um, staph infections and, like, necrosis and, um, there's something called somastia, wind up with kind of like a, a uniboob type of a thing happening. Um, there's bottoming out where the implant kind of falls down below the crease of the breast, uh, which is not that pretty either. Breast implant illness, very, very controversial. And people report having, uh, you know, just this really bad collection of symptoms after they get their breast implants. And when they explant or remove their breast implants, they report um, relief from those symptoms. Um, there are a lot of people that believe that breast implant illness is sort of made up. Um, there are also a lot of people that believe that it's a totally real I thing. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm not someone to make a judgment on whether or not I think something is real when I have no experience with it. So, you know, I'll keep an eye on my symptoms, but I'm not going to be one that is quick to uh, chalk up any symptoms like that to breast implant illness just because I know my body and I know the way that I normally feel. However, if I notice that there are any, you know, extreme changes in the way that I feel um, and the way that my, my body is doing, I will definitely kind of consult with my surgeon and my, and my MD just to figure out if, if my implants could be causing any kind of issues like that. Um, so I don't have strong feelings about it. It is something that you hear about a lot, but that's that. Another thing to note, which I will go into a little bit more in detail in my next video, is that especially if you get submuscular implants, they do not look normal at first. It is a months long process. They don't look like normal boobs for a pretty long time. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later, but just keep that in mind. It is, it is a process. Recovery time from the procedure. Um, this is going to depend a lot on the type of surgery you get and who your surgeon is, but just keep in mind that this is something that's probably going to put you out for a little while. Uh, when it comes to doing anything active, especially anything with the upper body or if you have like a more physical job, um, you know, most of the surgeons that I saw recommended waiting a good four to six weeks before you really start kind of ramping up activity again. So that's definitely something that you're going to want to keep in mind. Uh, if you are planning on embarking on any kind of a journey like this, do your own research. I am going to leave links that I used uh, as far as doing my own independent research uh, in the comments below and probably in the last kind of title slide here. Um, and just consult with as many different surgeons as you can. And in the next video, I am going to be talking about kind of what led me to make the decision and my journey on the way there, uh, because I had a lot of very different conflicting opinions from medical professionals that was pretty interesting to me. So I will be talking about that in the next video. Thanks for watching.